Now, I've been trying to look at some of the answers, and it's very standard. A lot of you have memorized, one way or another, the answer 45 degrees. Right? And you're, you feel under time pressure, your beinjik is telling you to put down your, that 45 degrees. But that was for a specific case. If I'm on flat ground, that angle gives me the maximum range. It doesn't give me the maximum height at a wall that's a distance all away. But you also have a human brain, which if you use it, it's a very useful tool. And what's it telling you? It's telling you to take a derivative. Find the maximum by taking derivatives. That's how we do it. Okay. So let's solve this problem. I have a wall, a vertical wall at a distance L away. I have gravitational acceleration G. Let me put my coordinate frame exactly at the point I'm throwing my stone. Now, what's the x component of my velocity? It's v0 cosine theta, and y component of my velocity is v0 sine theta. Now, it's really simple. We factor our motion into motion in x direction and motion in y direction by just looking at the components of my position vector. Motion in x direction is motion with constant velocity, constant speed. So this is just going to be v0 cosine theta times t. And y of t will be my initial velocity is v0 sine theta times t minus 1 half g t squared. Why do I have a minus sign in the second term? Because our acceleration is towards the minus y direction, right? So what am I trying to find out? I actually want to find out the height my stone hits the wall, right? So at that point, What's my x position? What will be my position? It will be L. Right. So let's first find time of flight. How long does this stone fly before hitting the wall? And I can find that at exactly time of flight, Tf, my x position will be L. So V0 cosine theta Tf is L. Tf is L over V0 cosine theta. How can I find the height this stone hits the wall? It will be the y position at exactly that time, right? Do I know the y position for all times? Yes, so I'll just plug in Tf into that expression. So V0 sine theta, I don't know how to write that, sine theta times Tf minus 1 half G Tf square. Let's plug in the expression for Tf, V0 sine theta L divided by V0 cosine theta minus 1 half g L square divided by V0 square cosine square theta. <coughs> v0 is cancelled here, so I have tangent theta L minus 1 half g L square over V0 square cosine to minus 2 theta. And that is my h for any given angle theta. I can easily calculate it. Good. Let's make sure that I am actually hitting the maximum 
point. How do I make sure of that? I take a derivative of h with respect to theta and set it to 0. So to find the maximum, dh d theta must be equal to 0. Let's take a derivative of this expression, d by d theta. L tangent theta minus 1 half g L square over V0 square cosine to minus 2 theta. L is a constant. I take it outside. What's the derivative of tan tangent theta? OK, you don't remember. d by d theta tangent theta is d by d theta. What's the expression for tangent in terms of sine and cosine? It's sine theta divided by cosine theta. How do I take the derivative of a division? I take the numerator, take its derivative, which is cosine theta, multiply it by the denominator, cosine theta, minus I take the derivative of the denominator, which is going to be minus sine theta, multiply it by the numerator, sine theta, divided by square of the denominator, cosine square theta. So this is going to be cosine square theta plus sine square theta divided by cosine square theta, or 1 over cosine square theta. So that's the derivative of a tangent, 1 over cosine square theta, how about the second term? All of these, 1 half g l square over v0 square are constants. I take them out. How do I take the derivative of cosine to the minus 2? Very simple. How did I take? Let's remember. d by dt, t to the n, a power is, derivative is very simple, n times t2 and minus 1. So I have cosine to the minus 2. First, I treat it like a power. So it will be minus 2 times cosine to the minus 3 theta. But now, I need to use the chain rule. What I treated as a power was the cosine. I need to put the derivative of the cosine with respect to theta here. So this is going to give me L 1 over cosine squared theta. I have a minus sign, minus sign. These two cancel, so I have plus G L squared over V0 squared. And D cosine theta, D theta is minus sine theta. So I have minus sine theta divided by cosine cube theta. All right? Now I need to equate all of this to 0. This was the derivative. OK? So the second thing, second uh, part is minus. I take it to the other side. 1 over cosine squared theta is g L squared over v0 squared sine theta divided by cosine cube theta. This just gives me a cosine. Or in other words, tangent theta is v0 square. 1 power of L cancels divided by GL. So this angle theta is arc tangent v0 square over GL. That was the second part, v0 square over gl. Because I was given numerical values, let me plug them in. v0 was supplied as 10 square root of 3 meters per second. g is 10 meters per second square. And l is, I don't remember, but 10 meters again. Now, can I check the result? 
right away what should be the unit of tangent theta it should be unitless that it should have no units right so v0 square over gl what's the unit for v0 meters per second i need to square it how about g meter per second square l is meter so this is one these cancel so units are looking fine here okay let's put in the numbers tangent inverse v0 square is 3 times 100 g is 10 l is 10 so apparently theta is tangent inverse 3 which is not 45 degrees okay so do not memorize stuff now you have better tools you can take derivatives right you're more powerful than you realize you just have to relax and use these tools let's actually plug in what's h max that was the first part of the question well i already have an expression for theta h of theta from above is tangent theta l l minus one half g l square over v zero square times one over cosine square theta. Hmm. Tangent theta I know, but how about cosine square theta? How do I calculate it? Well, I know that tangent theta is 3. That means I have a triangle where this angle is theta. The opposing side is 3 and the closer side is 1. So what's the length of the hypotenuse? Square root of 10, which means cosine theta is 1 over square root of 10. Now I can plug in everything. I know the numerical values. H max is tangent theta is 3 times L is 10 meters minus 1 half. G is 10. L square is 100. V0 square is 300. 1 over cosine theta is 1. So I have 1 over 10 here. Okay, let's cancel. I have 30 minus, what do I have here? 150 divided by 3, right? So it's going to be 40 divided by 3 meters. How many of you actually reached this result? Oh, I'm impressed. Three or four people reached this result. But let me warn the rest of you. This was a midterm one question some years ago. Okay, So you need to be able to solve a problem at this level within half an hour or so, or 20 minutes. Okay. Any questions? Yes. How many points uh, can you take without any single values? It depends on the problem. Usually, the simpler the problem is, numerical values are more important. For harder problems, numerical values. I don't know. I mean, I, if I were to grade it, I'm a harsh grader. I would take at least half the grade off if you do not use numerical values because whether they are given. Okay. Now there is generally an basic science approach to asking questions and an engineering approach to asking questions. So in physics department, we generally grade to see whether the student has understood the method. In engineering, the grading is whether they actually got the right answer. So that's, there's a bit of different philosophies there. Any other questions, comments? 
OK. Then let's talk about maybe the most important things we're going to learn in this lecture in Physics 101. Let's talk about Newton's laws of motion. So here's what I'll do. I know that most of you have studied these laws before, but let me first state them. And then we'll talk about each one of them in turn. Right? So let's start with the first law. A body at rest stays at rest and a body in motion keeps moving with constant velocity unless a net force acts on them. Second law. The acceleration of a particle is proportional to the net force acting on it and inversely proportional to its mass. This is more readily expressed as a formula f net is equal to mass of the object times acceleration. And the third law tells me if an object is acting a force F on another object, the acted upon object applied an equal but opposite force minus f to the first object. Just a moment. Yes? Let's talk about it. This is a good question, actually. Now, I've stated the laws of motion. But first, I need to define something. What's the net force of an object? Net force means if I have some object, there may be many forces acting on it. F1, F2, F3, F4. F net, the net force, is the addition of all forces, all forces acting upon the object. And be careful, this is a vector sum. Okay? So the net force also is a force of, a net force is a summation of all these forces. Now, really, the first law tells me that my acceleration, which is 
which means constant velocity means acceleration is zero. A is equal to zero. And it basically, the first law tells me that if f net is zero, then acceleration is zero. And it's exactly a special case of second law. If f is zero, a is zero. So why did Newton actually put it as his first law, right? Why didn't he say f is equal to ma and, you know, let the rest be. Okay, so maybe I should, we should say it's actually sort of a political statement or philosophical statement because what was the situation before Newton? What did people think? Well, many, many years ago before Newton, Aristotle was also thinking about physics, about how objects move. And he had a different idea. He said, the natural status of an object is to be at rest. A, all the objects want to be at rest. So if I have a particle in motion, unless I act upon it with a force, it will choose to stop. And Aristotle was now fool. He was actually observing the universe around him. He saw that he actually, if he threw something on a flat ground, it stops. Okay. And to make it go faster, he has to apply more force. It was only Galileo who really understood that all of this is because when I'm moving an object on a flat ground or even in air, there is a force, there is the friction force acting on these objects. That's why it's not a particle with net zero force on it, okay? So Newt basically took Galileo's statement and made it into a law. He said, hey, if I'm in perfect vacuum, if there are no forces acting on my object, or if there are forces which cancel each other acting on this object, then it's going to keep with going with constant velocity. And that was very counterintuitive in that time. People did not believe it because people were looking around. Everything they can see, because there is air friction, all sorts of friction around them, they never actually saw an object that's moving with constant <coughs> velocity. That's very strange. However, if we were some space civilization without any gravity, or with very small uh, air pressure, everything we trip would be going away in straight lines. So that motion with constant velocity would be the standard kind of motion we would see around it. The nice thing that Galileo and Newton did, they were able to do an abstraction. They said, hey, what happens if there was no air? What happens if there was no gravitational force? What should be determining my velocity, and they said, hey, if there is no force, then there should be no acceleration. So that's not a simple thing. Now that we understand it as a first law, there were really centuries of debate around this. Okay. And the nice thing about Newton and Galileo, they said, hey, this is not a philosophical discussion. We need to do experiments to prove this. Okay. That was the big step. First, Newton said, hey, we need to use mathematics to do predictions. We need to write these in mathematical forms. And then we need to test this experimentally. That's how modern science was born. We do not accept Newton's laws because they are uttered by some distinguished gentleman because Newton was such an honorable and nice guy. No, we accept Newton's laws because they are supported by all experiments we see around us. And we, even better than that, we know instances where Newton's laws do not apply. If I actually move very, very fast, close to speed of light, Newton's law is not correct. It's an approximation to a general law. But it works very well in the time scale, length scales that I generally am interested in. Again, if I look at systems which are very, very small, the rules of the game apparently are different. Newton's law is not true. 
There is quantum mechanics at play. It actually gets more complicated. But Newton's law is a very, very good approximation to quantum mechanics when you actually take objects, objects which are you know, of meter length scale, centimeter length scale, and the masses we see around us. Question? Uh, please shout, I cannot hear you. My hearing is not. How did Newton test? Uh, he did not test his first law. That's the interesting thing. He actually tested his second law by looking at the motion of planets. And planets, they are moving in interstellar space where there's little friction. The nice thing Newton did is he said, hey, the law applies to the planets. Maybe they are also, it's applying to the apple which is falling on my head. So he basically made a synthesis saying everything follows the same law. Okay. It does apply to rotation and we'll see that to keep an object rotating, we need to apply a force. So because there is a constant acceleration. And the nice thing is that force must be directed inward. No, that's very good. It, unless you actually apply a force towards the center, it will not keep rotating infinitely. For example, if you tie a strong rope, you can rotate. Then it will keep, it will keep rotating, yes. No, it will keep going with, but what, what does the law say? It says moving with constant velocity. Constant velocity motion is linear motion, not rotating motion. We just saw that rotating motion requires constant acceleration. Good question. Any other questions? Now, here's the thing. Force is such a natural concept. We apply it all the time to everything around us. You know, I hit my head on the board. It you know, hurts. So force is very intuitive, very natural. But when we are doing science, we actually have to define things more precisely. And here is my take on Newton's second equation. It's actually not a law. It's not a statement. It's the definition of force. Now, what has Newton enabled us to do? Here, we've studied motion. But we did not actually talk about what caused motion up till now. We've always said, hey, this is moving with velocity v. Where is the position? What's the acceleration? We never asked what causes that acceleration. And Newton basically said, what causes acceleration is the thing we call force. And why was Newton so successful? Because we can make more general statements around force. We can say, hey, if a spring is stretched by a distance x, the force it's going to apply is going to be k times x. We're going to say, if I have two masses, a distance r apart from each other, the gravitational force between them will be such and such. If I have a mass on a table, the friction force will be such and such. So instead of making statements about motion, we will be able to make more general statements about forces. Okay. So a other way to think about this is F equals MA is the definition of force, but force is a more general concept for which we can actually make more and more general statements. The same idea still keeps going around in physics. What we now know is that many different forces we see around each other, all the forces in the universe, as far as we know, can be reduced to four fundamental forces. Okay. That's a great synthesis of the previous century, at the 20th century. We said that all forces arise from either gravity or electromagnetism or two types of nuclear force, 
weak nuclear force and strong nuclear force. So it's really great that all the, our understanding of physics is such that all the forces in the universe can be, as far as we know, we can trace their origin back to one of these fundamental forces. Maybe there is another force we haven't discovered yet, it's possible, but so far the theory which uh, understands these forces is acting quite well. Now, when I bang my hand on the table, I definitely felt a force. What's the nature of that force? Which, which causes? Is it gravity, electromagnetism, weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force? It's electromagnetism. Why? Because all objects we see around us are made up of atoms. And the atoms, what do they have on the outside? Electrons. And the other atoms on the table, they also have electrons on the outside. So when I bang my hand on the table, those electrons actually repel each other, and that's the force I've felt. Okay. So this is really nice. Instead of documenting like, you know, like stamp collecting all kinds of possible motion, all kinds of accelerations, velocities, we're making very general statements about how force applies, and then we can find out how each and every object moves in a complex system. All right? Yes. Excellent question. So if everything repels each other, what happens if I put some glue on the table and you know, stick my hand on it? And to be able to understand, it's very funny, it's easy to understand why things repel each other. It's very hard to understand why some molecules bond to each other. If I take two hydrogen atoms, it will make an H2 molecule. You'll need some force to tear these apart. And to be able to understand how a molecular bond forms, you have to know quantum mechanics. Okay. For physicists, there is the physics course 325. For chemists, there is quantum chemistry course. I think most of you in this class will understand the nature of the chemical bond, but it's definitely not in Newton's equations. Okay. Good question. Let me tell you one more thing. Newton's laws. apply for point particles. It's another level of abstraction. Now, we're going to see more complicated systems in this course. Let me take a box, put a inclined plane, M1, M2, maybe tie it with a spring to something else, K, and apply a force F on it. The acceleration of this box, A, is not equal to sum of the mass inside. So F is not equal to ma for compound objects. If parts of the objects are moving with respect to each other, f equals to ma cannot be applied to it. If an object is really rigid, and we'll talk about what that means, if its parts do not move with respect to each other, then I can actually apply f equals ma. All right? But once parts of the object start moving with respect to each other, I cannot use F equals MA for a compound object. I can only use it for an object which has non-moving parts, which is rigid. All right? Question. Then they are not moving with respect to each other. If they, are, they have the same velocity, then F equals MA applies to the whole system. But if they are moving with respect to each other, then F equals MA will not matter. Uh, we'll see a few examples. Okay? 
Now, so, so far maybe I've been disrespecting Newton, right? I said the first law is a special case of the second law stated for political reasons, and second law is just a definition. <coughs> but now, third law is telling us something very profound about how nature works. It tells me that if I'm actually applying a force, F, onto this uh, screen, I'm actually receiving a force back. So the wall or the board is actually pushing me as much as I'm pushing it. And that reciprocal nature of forces we see all around us. Okay, everything I told you, gravitation, electromagnetism, nuclear forces, they seem to obey this principle. So it's actually very deep. Anytime, let's say, an electron and a proton interact, whatever force the electron acts on the proton, it receives it back. Okay? So this third law is very important. We will see that it will have an important consequence. It will give us a conserved quantity called momentum. Okay? In a month or so, we'll talk about momentum. Okay? But third law is really telling us something very deep about the nature. All right? So, let's solve two very simple examples. Okay. Let's say that Okay, I'm not even going to. Let's take a small block and a large block, M and M, under gravitational acceleration G. Show all the forces acting on M and M. Now, first thing is that, this, why do we have gravitational acceleration? Why if I let an object fall freely, it accelerates with gravitational acceleration g? Because there is gravitational force. What would be the amount of, for any object on Earth's surface, any object I have, there is always the gravitational pull of the Earth. And what is the amount of this gravitational pull? It's going to be m times g. That's why we define g. Okay? So gravitational pull on any object on Earth's surface is going to be m times g. Right? Now, we give every, actually, this is a force. And that force is not equal to the mass. But somehow in daily life, when you ask me how much I weigh, okay, I usually give you an answer in kilograms, 80 kilograms, 83 kilograms, right? So what's the difference? We have to define these two things separately. M is mass, so its unit is kilogram. The force here apparently has different units. Let's figure the, that out. F is equal to ma. So the unit of force must be kilogram times meter per second square. So that is my unit for forces. And it gets very tiring to say kilogram per meter, kilogram meter per second square all the time. So we give a short name to this derived unit. We call it a Newton. So our weight, so this is going to be my weight, in, is actually in Newtons. Okay, it's the force that gravity acts on me. 
it would be my weight. But in our daily life, because g is almost constant everywhere, we scale it out. Instead of talking about our weight, we talk about our mass. Okay? An 80 kilogram object on Earth would actually weigh 80 times g, which is 9.8 on Earth. But if I move to another planet with a different g, I would weigh something different. If I move to moon, I would actually weigh one sixth of my weight. Okay? Good. Now, show all the forces acting on M and M. Let's do that. Let's insert some space here. We talked about. Now, both of these objects are not moving. So they have zero acceleration. What does that mean? The net force on each one of them must be zero. So let's take the small mass, m. What forces are there acting on it? First, there is always m times g. That's gravitational force. But why is it not accelerating? Why is it not falling down? Because there is a rigid object below it, which means the object below that must be applying an equal an opposite force to cancel gravitational force acting on it. So I'll call this N1. That is going to be the normal force of M acting on M. So now the net force on small m is zero, which means n1 plus mg as a vector must be 0. OK? Hmm. How about the large m? What are the forces acting on it? There must be always my gravitational pull, mg. And why is it not falling through the Earth? Because, because there is a solid surface there, right? which must be applying a force upward. Let me call this N2. But is that it? No, it's not that. Because what did Newton's third law tell me? If there is a force acted by large m onto small m, small m must be acting an equal and opposite force to the large m. So there must be N1. No, I be very careful. So let I'm going to call it. If you want, uh, you you have a point. I'm using the same symbol right now. Let's be be, be careful. Let me call this n one acted by two and hit this one. N two acted by one. If you want to be more specific, okay? Because they are equal and opposite. But because I showed errors, I was just writing the the magnitude. Now, here's the thing. Again, the second object must not move, which means net force on it, mg plus n21 plus n2. Let's maybe make it n2 acted by ground. 2 ground is equal to 0. And furthermore, I know that Newton's third law tells me n12 is minus and 2, 1. OK? Now, when you weigh yourself, when you go step on a balance, okay. so and here's your lecturer sitting on it with a belly, OK? Now, what does the balance weigh? What does it show? It actually shows balance measures the normal force it's acting onto 
whatever is on it. So if you know, if I grab another object here, if I take another mass here, what's the balance going to show me? It's going to show me that there will be this M1G. It's going to be canceled by a force I applied to it. But it's also going to apply a force to me, F2, 1, and I'll have my own weight, M2G. So the balance here is going to show me, actually, M2G plus F2, 1 will be the normal force. The balance is acting on me. But F2, 1 is F1, 2, negative. So it's going to give me M2G plus M1G. All right? Let's solve one more quick example. Let's say I have M1 and M2 on a frictionless plane. And I'm applying a force F. Find the accelerations and the force M1 acts on M2. Now, you should always be careful. F equals MA is not valid for composite systems, right? In general, it's not valid if parts move with respect to each other. So what you need to do is individual objects should be separated, and the forces on individual objects should be clearly shown in your solutions. So what I'll do is I'll have M1. What are the forces on this M1? There is M1G, but it will be canceled by normal force of the ground on it. There is the force. F acting on to the right. But there must also be a normal force coming from the contact with the second object. And that will give me, let me call that normal force and let me call it N0, OK? How about M2? What are the forces on it? There is M2G, which will be canceled by a second normal force. But some force must be acting on it to the right. And that force in magnitude must be exactly N0 because of Newton's third law. Now, what is the acceleration of these objects? Let me call this A1 and this A2 to the right. Clearly, A1 is going to be F. I'm sorry, M1 times A1 is going to be F minus N0. And how about the second object, M2 times A2 would be N0. Now, these objects move together, which means their positions are same up to a constant, which means their velocity is the same. If I take a derivative of the velocity, their acceleration must be the same. They are not moving with respect to each other. So A1 is actually equal to A2. Let me just call it A. M1A is F minus N0, M2A is N0. If I add these up, M1 plus M2A is F minus N0 plus N0. They cancel. So apparently acceleration is F divided by M1 plus M2. How about N0? N0 was M2 times acceleration. F divided by M1 plus M2. I told you that Newton's law is not valid for composite systems. Here, it seems almost valid, right? F equals M1 plus M2. Why is that? Because these two objects are not moving with respect to each other. If I actually tied 
a spring between them so that they could actually move with respect to each other. If our, I had some pulleys or some inclined planes so that they moved it equal to each other, F would not be equal to total mass times the acceleration of the system. All right? So be careful. And the nice thing is by doing this analysis, I can find the force one object acts onto the other one. I'll see you in three days.